This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. UFC 302 is just around the corner, and it should be a pretty fun one. And who better to break down all on that car that we can bet over at FanDuel Sportsbook than Austin Swaim. Austin is with us here for today to break down his thoughts on the main event, Islam Makachev taking on Dustin Poirier, and some bets elsewhere on the card for this week. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned, by Austin Swaim. Check out Austin on Twitter at aswaim3. Find his work at FanDuel Research over on the FanDuel Podcast Network, the FanDuel Research podcast feed as well, breaking down UFC each and every week. Austin, it is a delight to have you back on the show for today. How are you doing? I am doing great, Jim. I wanted to extend my condolences in a different sport because your Timberwolves met the same fate as my Clippers, which is the Dallas Mavericks ended up being a buzzsaw that we couldn't get through. So um, exciting times there. Like I've been enjoying the playoff stuff there. And then we got UFC 302 this weekend. So it's a good time to be Austin Swain. That's for sure. It definitely is. Um, Even though the Wolves went out, I can still be happy for their season because again, I'm not a big enough basketball fan to be horribly affected by it. And once they went down three, nothing, I gave up. So that was a nice feeling as a Minnesota sports fan. You seek defeat. You seek giving up. You want to just no longer have hope. And they gave that to me. So what more could I ask for of the wolves for this year than that? They had some fun. That's all I can really ask for. Yep. So happy regardless, despite the fact uh, that result, it should be fun to watch Celtics versus Mavericks as well. For today, we're going to dive into USC 302. We're going to break down the main event in depth, letting you know what Austin's overall view of the fight is stylistically, but then also where he sees value in that fight at FanDuel Sportsbook. Then we'll break down other money lines and props he likes for this week. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to the FanDuel Research Pod or the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Covering the Spread on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. If you like what you hear, Leave us a five-star rating and a review as well. And of course, the Covering the Spread podcast all available over on FanDuel TV Plus and the FanDuel YouTube page as well. If you want some thoughts on this weekend's NASCAR race, did break that down uh, in depth on yesterday's show for Gateway. So find all NASCAR thoughts over on yesterday's show. NBA Finals now just around the corner, but it's not too late to get in on the action with FanDuel because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to use on same game parlays, live bets if you want to bet on either the Celtics or Mastwood at all, and so much more. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and present in select states. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets, which expire seven days after receipt. Not available in North Carolina. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. FanDuel.com. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, D.C., Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Vermont, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777. Or visit ccpg.org slash chat Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700, visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia, 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call one 877 hope and y or text hope and y in New York. Now, Austin, let's kick things off here by talking about the main event. That is Islam Makachev against Dustin Poirier. Makachev, huge favorite at FanDuel Sportsbook. The money line now minus 650 was minus 670 yesterday. It's a bit of movement towards Poirier of late. And we'll talk about the markets in a second, but as they always say, styles make fights. So stylistically, how do these two guys match up? 
Yeah, I, I think it is an interesting matchup. One of the reasons that this money line is so wide is because I think for a lot of people, this feels like a bit of a rematch of when Dustin Poirier fought Khabib Nurmagomedov for the championship back in 2019 here at Lightweight. Khabib is the mentor of his now protege, Islam Makachev. They've trained forever since they were young children. Like They are as close as it gets. And they have very similar styles. Islam is an incredible Sambo-based wrestler, 3.17 takedowns per 15 minutes, 60% accuracy on them. A lot of the same similarities to Habib. It's kind of why he was fast-tracked to the title in the first place is because we know he is training with the best, one of the best to ever do it. And Dustin Poirier, if there's one poor part of his game that you look to that maybe isn't up to that elite level, it is his takedown defense. We saw it. He gave up three of seven takedown attempts in his last fight to Benoit St. Denis, just at 63% overall. But it's not like Poirier is a scrub as a grappler. He's got four UFC wins by submission. Like, I think he's okay in that realm. It's just Islam has been so dominant, so efficient, just a little bit like Habib was. But the great equalizer, as it was a little bit in that Habib fight, is that if Dustin Poirier can keep this fight at distance, because Islam isn't quite as proficient as Habib was, then it becomes into his wheelhouse. Plus 1.09 striking success rate. That's in an absurd 30 fight sample at this point for Poirier. He is really great as far as a boxer. If this was a boxing match, he'd be favored. Knockouts of Conor McGregor times two, Justin Gaethje, Eddie Alvarez the problem for him will be defending those grappling advances and that's why the line looks as it does because Khabib Nurmagomedov submitted Dustin in the third round and I think a lot of people are expecting a similar result but there are a few differences here um which which we'll highlight when we talk about actually going to bet this guy okay so it sounds like there is a big weakness for Poirier, which meshes well with the strengths for Makachev. How much does yeah. that matter? Because it sounds like, based on what you're saying, the money line is very reactive to that one key weakness for Poirier. Is it overreactive, though? Yeah, I, I will say I believe that Dustin Poirier's wrestling defense has improved significantly since 2019. Benoit St. Denis is a similarly efficient grappler. It's a, actually kind of a good matchup for uh, testing how he might do against Makachev. And he did okay defending the takedowns. Three out of seven is not like a, a super poor efficiency rate in that particular matchup. And my model, I, I, I would lie if I say I haven't lost a little bit of sleep over this because I thought I had a typo somewhere or something was going wrong. My model has Makachev at minus 130. And I that is so far off market that I can't take it seriously. But the reason is because I can't lie to it when I look at Islam Makachev's results relative to a guy like Khabib Nurmagomedov, you say it's a huge weakness or Makachev is this dominant wrestler. Well, just two fights ago, he goes to a split decision with Alexander Volkanovsky, who's a featherweight, gives up a lot of size in this division, wasn't really able to take him down. You know, he was able to take down Charles Oliveira. Oliveira has some wrestling deficiency issues, but it's just kind of a sample size question from my model at this point. We don't have the same track, rec track record that we had for Habib. I see the efficiency and I'm like, yeah, he's pretty good at it. But there is some sort of variance here that Poirier could stay at distance. We saw Makachev drop in the fifth round of that Volkanovsky fight, and Poirier is a guy that has a lot of power, certainly has better pace at distance. You look at the level of competition. Dustin Poirier has been fighting in the top 10 of lightweight since the mid-2010s. Islam Makachev, only one win over a top 10 lightweight right now because he had the weird little back and forth with Volkanovsky. So it's really tough for me to lie to my model and to get it to say something different here, knowing that I know Makachev probably has a lot of those same advantages Habib does, but this line still ultimately feels pretty wide to me. And you look at some other analytical models, D ratings, about 77% implied for Makachev. So you're really teetering on the value of whether or not his money line is value. I think it's Poirier or Pass in this spot, and I haven't quite decided which of those angles that I'm going to take. Okay, so your model is heavily in on Poirier here as yes. his money line is plus 440 at FanDuel Sportsbook. You said you have not taken yet, though. Yeah. Would it need to lengthen more for you to buy in? Or are you more so thinking, I have better routes to betting this fight than going with the money line straight up? Yeah, so this plus 4, 440 is actually the largest that I've seen it so far. And so I'm just waiting simply to get the best of the number sure. that I possibly can. As, you know, money understandably comes in on Makachev here, I might as well be responsible if I'm going to do it. But I, I, it's not really about the number per se. It's not like I'm betting analytically against a model. I think I probably am going to end up passing from a money line perspective here. Um, 
it, you could potentially look at a prop in lieu of this. We'll talk about maybe the dynamic of early late in this fight, but um, the money line itself has a lot of layers to it and my model's not exactly helping me. So it's never a bad thing to pass if you're not sure. Exactly. A no bet is better than a bad bet. And yeah. that is uh, a good mentality to take always, but especially here when it's plus 440. So pretty long August in Poirier. But for Austin, it sounds like it's either Poirier or pass when it comes to the money line. Mm -hmm. You've alluded to, though, potentially some props that could stand out to you in this match. So when you look at the prop markets of FanDuel Sportsbook, Austin, where are you seeing value there? Yeah, so I've, I've talked about it that I think the drama in this fight is that I don't see Makachev as this sort of dominant top player that Khabib Nurmagomedov was. Well, that fight with Poirier with between Habib and him went into the third round. So if you go to the round or the time props on FanDuel Sportsbook, there are odds for this fight to start round three. I actually really like it to start round three at minus 102. It's about a pick em. This is right teetering on the edge. It, technically, this would have cashed in the Habib Poirier fight, even though the finish came later that round. And Dustin is just a guy that is very competent with his submission defense. Um, he, he wasn't. He didn't get submitted in over six minutes of control time against Saint Denis. Makachev. I think if you like Poirier in this fight, you want length. Makachev has finished five, uh, six of his last seven fights in the first or second round. So if we get that dominant role, it probably is coming on the Makachev side. Where if this fight gets into deeper waters, we saw Islam start to get tired against Volkanovski. That is where I think Poirier, who has been there, done that, has a couple of twenty-five minute fights in the till. I think he's got the experience advantage and that he's more accustomed to this weight cut in a championship setting. I think that favors Poirier. So leaning toward Poirier having more of a shot than the odds imply, I think you got to lean toward a longer fight. So I actually like this fight to start round three at minus 102, whether or not Islam wins it or not. Now that is lengthened to or come down to minus 110. Is that still a value in your eyes versus minus 102 earlier on today? Um, yes, yes, it is. That's by the way, um, it, that's, that's an interesting move um, because that means that it's actually taking money, right? That right. we're looking at taking money. I think that's interesting when a lot of the public perception is that Makachev is this dominant finisher, hasn't gotten to a third round. Now all of a sudden the line is kind of moving the other way. It's a peculiar turn. I, I certainly don't hate it. When you look at my, my model has projected the total, I feel comfortable about that. I've got this fight 26.6% likely to go the distance. It's 24.6% implied on FanDuel. So a tiny smidge of value on length. I like attacking it here from the perspective of it's not overly likely these guys go 25 minutes with the knockout power and the submission danger involved. Okay. So Austin's favorite bet in this match is for the third round of start. That is now minus 110 of FanDuel Sportsbook. And again, for the money line for this one, it is either Poirier or pass for Austin. Plenty of other fights, though, Austin, uh, scattered across both the prelims and the main cards. So when you're looking at other fights on this USC 302 card, where do you see money line value for this? As always, I love to dig into the nitty gritty. We'll dive into the prelims. I'm so excited to talk about these two fights with you because it's just a general principle I have when I'm looking at the prelims. Phil Rose taking on Jake Matthews at welterweight. Over time, you kind of develop a sense of bad ideas in betting whatever sport is your niche sport. Laying substantial chalk with Jake Matthews is a bad idea. You look how he's performed relative to odds in a long sample dating back to when he was 18 years old. He's 9-5 and five as UFC favorite. He's 3-2 and two as an underdog. I love him as an underdog against maybe the oversold up-and-coming prospect. But as a favorite, he's floundered four times higher than this betting number. He's been dropped three times in his last three fights. And he only has one win over a guy who's still on the UFC roster. That was Li Jing Liang back in 2017. And Phil Rowe? He's a bona fide roster member. He's three and two. Could argue he should be four and one. His last fight was a split decision with Neil Magny inside the rankings. Rowe is this big, tall, lanky guy. Excellent power, 1.0% knockdown rate. He'll have a seven inch reach advantage here. I think the thing that is shaky is that his takedown defense, 59% on paper from some early career struggles, but he defended all three attempts from a ranked guy like Magny. I feel good about that. I don't feel like Matthews necessarily always goes to his wrestling when he should anyway. My model has Phil Rowe at plus 115 here, so I think the plus 128 odds. Small value, slight analytical value, but the thing that I love about that is I thought if anywhere Matthews was going to look sparkling, it would be with his analytics. So the fact that my model also looks at Roe and says, hey, he's got a pretty good shot, makes me feel even better about my anecdote. Friends don't let friends lay chalk with Jake Matthews. <laughs> I love that. Uh, good to have idioms when it comes to this stuff. Uh, Phil yeah. Rowe currently plus 128, taking on Jake Matthews in this one. You talked about the earlier data from Roe in his career. And 
obviously that's going to stay in the stats forever. How yep. much do, do you care about the eye test when it comes to trying to identify whether a fighter has made gains in certain areas over time? Is it primarily you just watching these matches and deciding, oh, okay, that is a legitimate improvement and I can downplay concerns from earlier on? Yeah, uh, it's certainly if I target an angle and I know that I I have a notebook on a few fighters where I'll say, hey, this guy ends up and has ended up improving his takedown defense. But you can also look at recent trends, like looking at his fight against Magny, where he defended all of those takedown attempts. He defended both from Nico Price in the fight before that. So now five straight takedown defense as competition is getting better. By the way, Jake Matthews, identical takedown accuracy to Neil Magny, 40 percent, 40 percent. So. It's not that I think Phil Rowe is going to do a perfect job defending takedowns here. I think it's good enough to exercise it as advantages, his reach, his power. And it, that's pretty, I would line this fight much closer to a pick as my model says. So I absolutely think plus one, almost plus 130 is really nice value with him. Okay. So plus 120 to Phil Rowe, the first money line for Austin. Which other money lines do you like across this card? So I might be upsetting some betters that have already gotten to the window here because I'm going against one of the chalkier favorites on the card because I I marinated it on this all week. I've really tried to be more cynical when it comes to these heavier price tags because I don't want to just buy into narratives that drive the price up unfairly. I, the more I looked into Basile Hafez on the earlier prelims, who is just presumed to walk through Mickey Gall, Mickey Gall a bit of a meme in MMA circles. Well, this is Mickey Gall's home game. He's a North Jersey kid. This card's a newer. Um, the less impressed I got with Basile Hafez, the further I dove. He has a card worst, negative 3.40 striking success rate. He only landed three of the 20 takedowns he tried, so he wasn't super efficient trying to get things to the mat. And he went to a split decision with Anthony Ivey on the regional scene. That's not a good result. Ivey 0-2 washout of UFC hasn't been here for two or three years at this point. Mickey Gall's the guy that they fed CM Punk back in the day, the former WWE star. So it's like, you can't take that win overly seriously. It was kind of a, a, a matchmaking showmanship type of matchup. But you look who Mickey Gall has lost to in UFC. They have a combined 54 and 33 record. This dude loses to guys who have experience and success. Neither of those fit Hafez at this point. I don't really know of an angle that I would take. Mickey Gall's a great submission guy, has five first round submissions. Um, I think Havez's striking defense is an issue for a potential knockout. And then he also got tired in his last fight where Mickey Gall, I've seen him go 15 hard minutes. So I don't have like a prop or an angle I would take here. I just like the Mickey Gall money line plus 300. I don't think even if Havez wins, it should be nearly this wide from diving deeper. Okay, so Gall is plus 300. Explain to me why he's a meme, because uh, I'm curious about this. You said he's a Jersey kid. I want to yeah. know more about this. Well, you know, so his first two UFC fights were against Mike Jackson, who was a decorated boxer that comes over to UFC, had no grappling skills at all, got submitted by just about everyone in his path. And then CM Punk, who had no professional MMA experience before he joined UFC. So, like, this guy was at the bottom of the roster back in 2018, whenever, whenever those fights were taking place. And now he's kind of had to work his way out of that reputation. I don't really think he has. Look, here, There's another Mickey Gall result that stands out is that he lost to Mike Perry, who was a talented guy, but kind of a head case where Mike Perry fired his entire corner and only had his girlfriend giving him ice and water in the corner. So <laughs> like there are these results where you're like, oh, well, Mickey Gall is kind of you, you can make fun of him. He's not to be taken seriously. But yeah. Mike Perry, higher level of competition. A lot of the guys he's lost to higher level competition, including Mike Malott in his last fight, like they're guys that are multi-time winners. They're successful. I don't know if I have that prior about Hafez at this point. I'd, I'd pick Hafez in a straight pick, but I, I don't think this line should be nearly this wide. <laughs> okay, perfect. So the two money lines Austin likes are Phil Rowe plus 128 and Mickey Gall at three to one. What about props? Where are you seeing value there, Austin? Yeah, and I love some of these FanDuel exclusive markets. Um, it, you know, I think that these are ones that you want to particularly jump on when you're looking at FanDuel because I can't, you can't find them anywhere else. And to me, I feel trapped with a money line if I can't bet on FanDuel Sportsbook or if it's not available for whatever reason. But FanDuel's got us covered in the co-main event between Sean Strickland and Paolo Costa because I love this angle that they have in the round props section. Um, it's Sean Strickland to win by round four, round five, or by decision. I, I kind of feel trapped with his money line, not knowing if he's going to get the finish or not, what round it might come. But this is the easiest fight on the card for me to close my eyes and envision. Strickland, the former champion in this division, is an elite pressure striker, plus 1.58 striking success rate. I mean, he boxed Israel Adesanya's ears off 
for 25 minutes, and he could have this title still. He lost by a split decision. And on the other side, Paulo Costa is a consistent underperformer. He's lost the distance strike, striking differential in four of his last five fights, negative 0.18 striking success rate overall. He's got this reputation as like this mammoth puncher because he had a bunch of knockouts back when we were still having stickers on the shorts. But it's not really played out that way in the data. He's got just a 0.64% knockdown rate. So these guys both don't have a lot of power. It's going to be a lengthier fight. I see this as like a 25 minute or slightly less striking match where Sean Strickland is ahead. I don't know if he gets the finish. So I'm kind of struggling. Do I, do I go points? Do I go round four? Do I go round five? Sean Strickland's got us covered with, or FanDuel's got us covered with all of those outcomes at plus plus one fifteen. It's one of my favorite ways to target this fight. Um, I just can't see Sean Strickland winning early. He has never won a fight and landed a knockdown with less than 65 significant strikes thrown. So he's got a kind of mount damage, which could be an interesting storyline. New gloves in place. A lot of fighters expecting cuts that could play into an early finish here compared to normal as well. So I factored all those things in and I love this prop here. Okay. Remind me of which market that was again. It's so it's under round props and then it's okay. alternate round betting. It's this is okay. good so people can know where to find it. Um, and then Sean Strickland by round four, five, or decision sitting at plus 115. I, I love this angle because if Strickland's going to score a TKO here, it'll be mounting damage later in the fight. Uh, my model actually is a significant favorite, thinks that this fight's going to go the distance 75.4% of the time. I just don't want to get burned if I bet points and all of a sudden maybe an early cut stops the fight or something like that. I love FanDuel for having this market up for us to target this angle. Uh, FanDuel appreciates you cutting this promo for them. So uh, thank you, I'm sure, for that. Uh, but that is in, again, the round prop section at FanDuel Sportsbook. Go to the alternate round betting. You can bet Sean Strickland round four, five, or by decision. That is plus 115 at FanDuel Sportsbook for the co-main event. Any other props you like on this card, Austin? Yeah, so we're going to stick on the main card with one of the more random main card fights of the year. These guys aren't ranked. Um, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a disappointing undercard. There are a few reasons we had fights fall off and things like that. But first fight on the pay per view is going to be Randy Brown taking on Elijah Zaleski dos Santos. I think it's a great example of targeting a prop in lieu of a money line, just from a value perspective. When these guys, he's coming. Randy Brown's coming off a first round win over Muslim Salakov, thirty nine years old, aging out a little bit, but his four wins before that came via decision. Elijah Zaleski dos Santos, one career loss by early finish in fourteen fights. There is a reason my model has this fight seventy five point six percent likely to go the distance. And Randy Brown's a guy that's built to win point fights in this division. Big seventy eight inch reach. He'll have five inches of reach here. Younger guy by four years. These guys have near identical striking success rates and efficiency. But Randy Brown has faced slightly tougher competition. He's got some losses inside the rankings, like Vicente Luque um, lost to Jack Della Maddalena, who's a top five guy in the division. Zaleski hasn't quite been up there yet. But this is an instance where my model only has Brown minus one forty. To win so i'm not showing value on his money line but yet i've got him 40 percent likely to win by decision or plus 150 so if you go to his method of victory he's plus 180 to win by decision i think it's a good way you can back randy brown by his most likely outcome we get a little bit of value here because he showed a knockout that was a little bit random against an older guy in his last fight brown is a point fighter i love this fight by decision so randy bound by points plus 180 showing good value on that and this is another good fight that i think i can close my eyes and visualize what it looks like Gotta love that. You can always yeah. love when you can envision how you see things playing out. You can see the styles meshing up well. And that yeah. leads to Austin liking Randy Brown by points at plus 180 at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is in addition to the Sean Strickland round four or five or decision plus 115. Mickey Gall to win at plus 300. Phil Rowe to win at plus 128. And then the Poirier Bakachev fight to start the third round. Minus 110 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. As mentioned, Austin is back with you later on today on the FanDuel Research Podcast. He's talking both his favorite bets and top DFS plays over on FanDuel for this card. So, Austin, uh, good luck with the podcast. Have fun and enjoy the card. We'll talk to you again in the very near future. You bet. It'll be a good one. We'll talk to you soon, Jim. All righty. You can find Austin on Twitter at aswain3. I am on X at Jim Sonis. I forgot last time. Remember this time on X at Jim Sonis. You can find FanDuel Research on X at FanDuel Research. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to all of you with your bets for UFC 302. Enjoy your weekend. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 